On the 12th of February 1998, Mr. Wombs applied for leave to appeal against his convictions. His grounds, which were drafted by counsel, were as follows Severance. The judge was in error and exercised his discretion wrongly in rejecting two defence applications to sever the drug counts from the murder counts. The first application was made prior to trial and the second, to sever the counts and to grant retrials, was made at the close of the Crown's case. No case to answer. The judge was in error in refusing to remove counts 2, 3 and 4 from the jury in that taking the evidence of the Crown at its highest, no reasonable jury, properly directed, could safely have convicted on it. Evidence of Jasper The judge was in error in refusing to allow Wombs, through counsel, to ask certain questions of a witness, Billy Jasper, called by Steele. Mobile telephone evidence. The judge erred in his summary of the mobile telephone evidence and failed properly to assist the jury to assess the significance of this evidence. Irrational verdicts. The verdicts of the jury were inconsistent in that the Crown's case on each count relied on the evidence of Darren Nichols. The jury must, in deciding to acquit Steele of the offence of possession of a firearm, have rejected Mr Nichols' account. The other convictions that were based on his evidence were inherently unsafe. On the 6th of July 1998, the single judge refused leave to appeal against the convictions. On the 25th of January 1999, the full Court of Appeal considered and refused a renewed application for leave to appeal. In refusing leave to appeal, the court made the following observations. Severance. The learned trial judge exercised his discretion correctly regarding severance of the counts of the indictment. It would have been artificial to invite the jury to hear the murder counts on their own, since it would have appeared to be an entirely motionless crime, which they could have found difficult to understand. No case to answer. The court agreed entirely with the trial judge's decision that there was a case for the defendants to answer. Evidence of Jasper. The judge was correct to exclude the evidence that Wombs sought from the witness Billy Jasper as it was clearly hearsay. Mobile telephone evidence. There was no reason to criticise the way in which the trial judge dealt in his summing up with the evidence of the mobile telephone calls. The judge delivered an extremely long but also extremely fair, comprehensive and neutral account of the evidence. In view of the length of the trial and the degree of the care which was devoted to the issues, the court thought it was unlikely that the jury were not fully alive to what the issues were. Irrational verdict. It was not irrational for the jury to acquit on count five and to convict on the first four counts. The evidence on count five was quite different. Wombs applied to the commission on the 15th of May 2002 Following a lengthy review, which included a Section 19 investigation, the Commission referred the case to the Court of Appeal on the 15th of December 2004. The case was referred because there was new evidence that before the trial, Mr Nichols entered into agreements with sections of the media whereby he was paid or be expected to be paid for his story, and those matters were not discussed by the Crown. In view of the use that the defence could have made of the new evidence in attacking Nichols' credibility and the centrality of his evidence to the Crown's case, the Commission considered that there was a real possibility that the Court of Appeal would quash the convictions. The Commission also considered that there was a real possibility that the Court of Appeal would receive new evidence from mobile phone expert David Bristow. 
on the 22nd of February 2006, the Court of Appeal considered the safety of Wyme's convictions alongside those of Steele and Corey. The following grounds were argued before the court on that occasion. Fresh evidence regarding Darren Nichols' contact with the media undermined the credibility of his evidence and the police investigation. Fresh expert evidence from David Bristow regarding the cell site analysis of mobile phone calls made around the time of the murders cast doubt on the safety of the convictions. The trial judge misdirected the jury and their right to draw adverse inferences from Mr Steele's failure to answer questions when interviewed by the police. The Court of Appeal upheld the convictions and dismissed the grounds of appeal for the following reasons. Regarding Darren Nichols' contact with the media. First, all the essentials of Nichols' account had been imparted to the police officers in interview and reduced to witness statements before he had any dealings with Thompson or any other members of the media. Although the defence case at trial was that what occurred at the interviews was the tip of the iceberg of corroboration between Nichols and Detective Constable Brown and Winston, there was not a shred of evidence to support such a contention. That issue was resolved by the jury and there was no new evidence to the contrary. Secondly, Nichols' account was long and detailed and all important respects had remained consistent throughout. He was in the witness box for almost three weeks and was rigorously cross-examined by counsel for all three appliance. Thirdly, this was not a case in which the defence had no material with which to cross-examine. The material at the disposal of the defence enabled them to present Nichols to the jury as a time-served criminal of some sophistication, a dishonest drug trafficker and a man with a corrupt relationship with a police officer. He told the jury of the long time he had spent in the company of police officers leading up to the trial in the course of which they had been anxious that he might fail to come up with proof. Notwithstanding the volume of material which the defence was able to throw at Nichols, the jury remained sure and unaimously so about the essentials of his account of the drug importations and the murders. In those circumstances, if the jury had known about the media contacts and Nichols had admitted them, as he would have been bound to do, although these contacts are to be depredicated, it is difficult to see how they would have added signification to the cross-examination armoury in the circumstances of this case. Fourthly, although the jury was convinced by Nichols' account of the essentials of the drug importations and the murders, it is explicit in the verdict of the not guilty of count five, the firearms charge, that they did not accept his evidence about everything. Baroness Kennedy seeks to turn that to her advantage of the applicants by submitting that. In effect, having stated, down the road to disbelief, the jury might have travelled further with one more push. However, the combination of the factors is equally sublicent to the analysis that the jury were prepared to accept Nichols on the drug importations and the murders, notwithstanding his many personal shortcomings in spite of the fact they were unpursued by his account of one of the offences alleged on the indictment. For our part, we consider it virtually certain that the jury would have also rejected that part of Nichols' evidence where he sought to minimise the involvement, involvement in and knowledge of the drug importations of his friend Reed. We cannot escape the conclusion that the jury, mindful of Nichols' personal shortcomings and accepting that he had probably not told the truth about, for example, the firearm, and that Reed was nevertheless utterly convinced by the account of the essentials of the drug importations and the murders. Fifthly, it is important not to forget the other evidence of the case. Nichols' account of the drug importations was supported by a quantity of documentary evidence, which confirmed aspects of his account, although, to the extent that it did so, the appellants also proffered expectations which were consistent with that material. Nevertheless, the evidence of the arrests of the appellants in proximity to the boat on the 8th of November and the finding of a small trace of cannabis in the boat gave some support to Nichols' account. So far as the murders were concerned, the telephone evidence to which we shall return was, in our judgment, strongly supportive of Nichols' account. Moreover, although Steele 
called alibi witnesses, the prosecution succeeded in proving that the alibi was false. Sixthly, even if contrary to the view we have expressed, a reasonable jury might conclude that Detective Constable Brown and Winstone had been less than candid in their evidence to this court about their knowledge of Nichols' contact with Thompson and the media that does not undermine Nichols' trial evidence to a material degree. Regarding the cell site analysis of mobile phones. The court heard Mr Bristow's evidence before deciding whether to receive it under section 23 of the Criminal Appeal Act 1968. Having heard the evidence, the court declined firmly to admit it, being satisfied that it was not new evidence. In reaching this conclusion, the court referred to the following points, which rendered the new tests less reliable than the tests conducted for the trial. When he conducted his original test pre-trial, Mr Bristow had not used Wimes' phone, but one of the same make and model. When conducting the new tests, Mr Bristow used Wimes' actual phone. Wimes' phone may have downgraded in the intervening five years since the original tests were performed. The conditions of the cell site had changed in the intervening five years. Wombs' phone was an analog mobile, and analog usage had declined markedly in the intervening five years, which would alter the conditions. Additionally, the court noted Mr. Bristow stated when given evidence for the appeal that he remained of the same opinion that he'd given at trial. The court accepted that the direction given at trial was different from the direction recommended in the current Judicial Studies Board directions, but noted that a change in the law would not automatically render a conviction unsafe. The court stated that it was very likely the judge's directions would be different if the matter were to be tried now. However, in the circumstances of this case, we do not think that any injustice whatsoever resulted from the directions which were given. No doubt as to the safety of the conviction is raised in our minds by this point, and accordingly, this ground of appeal is also rejected.